Right, gosh, I was going to say, can you hear me? You definitely can hear me. And I hope you notice four wonderful midlife women coming on with their handbags. <laughs> we all asked if we wanted to leave them in the green room. And we said, no, no, that's because we all live in London, I think. And we, uh, no offence to Queen's Park and anybody who lives in it. So, um, welcome everybody to this session. I feel I'm echoing. Um, which we've got three amazing writers. I'm going to, I'm Melissa Ben, and I'm a Queen's Park resident, among other things, and a writer and campaigner. And I'm going to introduce our speakers from this corner. So this is Caitlin Davis, who is a writer, written 12 books, and her latest, including novels, and her latest book is a really, really interesting history of Holloway Prison. And those who've been incarcerated there, particularly political women, we're gonna concentrate on. Rachel Holmes, biographer extraordinaire, author of four books, including a wonderful biography of Eleanor Marks. And Rachel is now working on a life history of Sylvia Pankhurst and her circle, is that right? Mm. And Shami Chakrabarti, who the technician out here thought was chairing the session because she's so famous. <laughs> and I had to say, no, no, it's me. Uh, and uh, Shami has written two books, because we're authors here, On Liberty, which I think you wrote when you were the director of Liberty, and now, can you hold it up? Of Women, her latest book. So it's really interesting, you know, you come along to a session like this with a clear idea of the shape. Oh, just before I, we get into the discussion, just to tell you how it's going to work, we're going to have a discussion between the four of us about the themes and then I'll open it up probably about 20 past four questions from all of you so there's a chance for you to ask. So we were talking in the green room about how <coughs> you know as the program promises it's about a hundred years since women some women got the vote and I of course well, not of course, but came from it from the rather conventional view that this is a, a marvellous thing and a marvellous anniversary to mark, which I think it is in many ways. But there's one thing I want to say about that before we go into was it as marvellous as it seems. When I was a young girl growing up in the 50s and 60s, of I assumed, you know, accepted that women had got the vote, thought it had happened a very, very long time ago. And one of the strange things about getting older is that time compresses <laughs> and now I look back and I think blimey only a hundred years mm. ago mm. and also I think which may sound very paranoid but look at Trump look at Putin look at the terrible people around the world and think it is not inconceivable I'm saying this to get you all whipped up before we start <laughs> it is not inconceivable that there might be some movement somewhere to take the vote away from women around the world. Mm. And who knows if our children face anything like that in the future. So I think it is a good thing. But the point was we were talking about not only the fact that the anniversary is of women over 30 with certain property qualification getting the vote, and it took another 10 years for all women to get the vote, but also the way this centenary has been marked. So can I just start by asking you, Shami, to give me your thoughts on what we're celebrating and are we celebrating it in the right way? Melissa, you're a minx. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been called that for a long time. <laughs> I was way too free with you in the green room, and now I'm going to have to try and... Um, of course, it's wonderful to celebrate some posh women getting the vote 100 years ago. <laughs> Is that it? Is that your... <laughs> No. Of course, uh, the test of a feminist is whether she unveils statues of Millicent Fawcett in Parliament Square. Of course, abortion rights in Northern Ireland don't matter. Of course, we shouldn't be celebrating the fact that such uh, poor men as were left after World War I got the vote. And of course, we shouldn't really be waiting another 10 years for the big party. Um, there. I there. What so I think. I think that's all underlaid with what we would call sarcasm. Yes. But just one thing, that I, one thing that I would pick up, again, in my political naivety, even at my advanced age, I thought Millicent Garrett Fawcett, the, the, the statue, it's a lovely statue, and I think it is important to have a woman in Parliament Square. But again, just to put you both on the spot, in the green room, we were saying... What do we think of individual statues? Was she the right woman? Anybody want to comment on that? I think, Rachel, you had views on that. Well, um, 
It's not that we're celebrating, and I mean, it, it's, it's perfectly reasonable, and uh, and there are lots of good reasons to have a centenary. It is, as as you've both indicated, how we're doing it, and actually, you know, the Millicent Fawcett figure is quite a, a good symbol of that. Um, I think Gillian Waring is a fantastic artist and sculptor, and I think that it, 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 you know, it's really important to to say that. And if you actually look at work that she's done elsewhere, which is group work, um, I unfortunately do not think that it's um, a lovely statue. I think she's have, have you? Have, have, have how many people have here seen the statue? Yeah. So right. it's just this sort of sense of um, that. What what I see is is someone who's sort of standing quite tight with a with a with an apologetic little banner. Really. Saying what does it say? Courage Co calls to courage yes, everywhere. And well, actually, the quote is courage calls to courage everywhere, and her vo and her voice should never be silenced. But of course, we can't have anything about voices and silence. So, I'm really interested in what that will look like in ten years' time. Um, and I just the uh, the sense of I mean there are other you were saying Caitlin there are other examples uh, of, of of statues that have sort of different oh, kinds yes. of energy and in fact there's mm -hmm. one of, of Emmeline Pankhurst which I think is, has been unveiled in Manchester um, where she is standing on a chair uh, which is wonderful because Emmeline would never have done that but nevertheless the kind of there's a sort of sense of of, of energy and place. Uh, where you know that it gives out in that way, but I think the other thing is that <clears throat> it seems curious to me, particularly when you're talking about um, a movement that 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 got so much support and came out of the abolition movement, because the earliest feminist and women's movement and the earliest women's suffrage movement was enormously supported um, actively uh, by by the abolitionists on and, and you know in Britain and indeed in America and a lot of the American abolitionists will come over here and talk on behalf of the of, of, of the suffragists and then suffragettes. Given the movements that it that it comes out of, it just seems it just seems uh, very uh, odd that those movements which are so closely tied to decolonization um, and anti-racism that in in a in a world where we have particularly young people all over the world and in Britain um, in universities and beyond questioning and tearing down statues and asking about what the symbolics of, of this this kind of way of representing history is um, we as British uh, you know <clears throat> feminists are, are busy building them no, that, that, yeah, that's interesting. But you see, I, again, maybe naively, had thought Emmeline Pankhurst, Christopher Pankhurst, they get a huge amount of press. And I was quite pleased to see a sort of const, you know, constitutional suffragist getting something. I mean, and I don't think the statue... I mean, I, let's see what the statue looks like in 10 years. We can, we can debate that. But you, can you just mention what you, again, were talking about earlier, about mm. a statue to a woman, a very different kind of woman? Well, I think um, what I'm saying about um, the, the centenary of, of some women getting the vote, you know, I completely agree with you. But on the other hand, it's like a good excuse to look at all the working-class women who got us the vote. Mm. Um, and in uh, Leicester, for example, they unveiled uh, a few months ago a statue of Alice Hawkins, who was uh, a working-class shoe machinist, mm. a trade unionist, before she became a suffragette. Mm. And, and I really like that statue because she's going like that. And I think that is a positive um, statue of a woman to have in a in a public place. Right. You can't imagine mm. Millicent Garrett going like that. Well, indeed. You? I mean, that's the point. Isn't <laughs> yeah. It? Okay. Because yeah. we can have Nelson Mandela, who was once called a terrorist, mm. but we can't have one of the women who were actually imprisoned and tortured by the British state, because it was all it was all done by petitions, wasn't it? Just like today, positive change is only made by clicking on a. Facebook page or something. And, like and remember that Theresa May had to be able to come along and approve it. So obviously, it, that kind of constricted its. And, they got, and also the, the, the ownership of the fund that the money comes for for the statue, because other statue funds that, that have existed for some time, such as the Wollstonecraft Memorial and the Sylvia Pankhurst yeah. Fund, also applied for funding from the same fund sometime before and were refused. Yeah. And so the Millicent uh, Fawcett one came in quite late and that one was got it. And of course, it's in line with having a Tory... Prime Minister, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. This is what I love about politics. That you take something that you think might be good and you go into it, but of course <laughs> it's not. That's, this is all, it's all very, very important. So, but, but let me kind of turn it back to my obviously natural optimism or 
at least sort of the, sen the sense of history that I want to have here today, which is that a lot of women paid a high price yeah. for us to get the vote. And, and reading your book, Caitlin, and I mean, it's mm. about women in Holloway throughout the 20th century. So it includes, you know, an interesting bit on Ruth Ellis, the last woman to be hung, and Edith Thompson, and these really touching stories about women criminals. But mm. the section on suffragettes in Holloway is quite shocking. Can you tell us a mm. bit about what they they went through? Well, I think, uh, how many of you know Holloway Prison in, in one way? In one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know it in that I way? Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when you, know, when, when you say suffragettes in, in, in Holloway Prison, the, the image that I grew up with you know, in, in the sort of 70s was, uh, was women being uh, forcibly held down by wardresses in their prison cell while male doctors shoved four-foot-long tubes uh, down their throats or up their noses, allegedly, to, to feed them. So that was the image that I always had, and it's uh, an image of um, a victimhood, really, and, and a martyrdom, in a way. And when I was researching Bad Girls, um, which is a history of Holloway Prison, I, I suddenly realised that, you know, wow, th their actual experience in Holloway hasn't been written about that much. And from... 1906, when the first suffragette, Teresa Bill Billington, um, was uh, imprisoned in Holloway, till 1914, when the last ones were released. Those suffragettes, those hundreds and hundreds of women, many of whom are working class uh, northern suffragettes, I mean, they fought the, the prison system every step of the way. They refused to be uh, searched and examined when they first entered the prison. They refused to be given a prison number or to, given their, be, to give uh, their names. Um, they refused to um, wear prison clothes. They refused to do the work they were given. They broke uh, their cell windows. I mean, it was a really concerted fight against the entire penal system to change it, not just for them, but, mm. but, but, for, you know, but for all women afterwards. And then, of course, um, they went on hunger strike. And I, I never actually knew why they'd gone on hunger strike. I just thought, oh, it's something they decided to do. I didn't realise it was because they were fighting for um, political prisoner status. And they said, unless we're recognised as political prisoners, we will refuse to eat. Um, and not only that, but they would stand outside the prison in mass demonstrations. And when the doctors came out that had been forcibly feeding their, their colleagues... Um, they would attack them with horsewhips and call them beasts and torturers. Um, and then they bombed in the winter of uh, 1913. They bombed the prison. And that was really the culmination of, of eight years, you know, fighting against the, the penal system. And um, so that's what amazed me about the suffragettes is it shifts that image from women being held down and forcibly fed to an image of women very, you know, uh, cleverly and determinedly working together in order to, to buck the whole penal system. Yeah, the thing that surprises me is that if, from what I've known about suffragettes from mainstream history, is I knew that they'd sort of done something with a post box and smashed windows, but I don't think I remember that they bombed Holloway Prison. Mm, and, and, and for me as a teenager, that would have been much more inspiring. <laughs> 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 you know, I think if I'd... Uh, I mean, no one, no one was hurt, you know, in, in that bomb attack. But this image of these, these women, you know, crouching in the garden of Dalmini Avenue, which runs behind the prison, and, you know, the, the sort of symbolism of, of blowing up a prison that since 1903 had um, held, you know, virtually all women who were seen as a threat to society in, in one way or another. I, I'm just wondering whether that's been a little bit suppressed by, but, you know, because you don't want to give the idea, do you, to political women that people have bombed uh, an institution of the state and then won what they Indeed. were arguing for. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, I mean, I mean, just, well, yeah, you, you I mean, it, it takes us back to our little what seemed like a trivial argument about which statues, who writes history? That's, 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 that's really political mm. and really important. Who writes history? Whose history is written? How is it shared? We know that there are people um, in this country, very important people in this country, who would like uh, uh, school children just to learn kings and queens of England by rote. Mm. Not to know a thing about mm. the stories that you're writing about, but it's so important that there are different histories written, not and not just um, not just domestic history either, mm. um, because I think um, 
feminist struggle is an internationalist mm. struggle for me for me at yeah. least anyway and so, so for example to my shame it's only a couple of years ago when the movie came out that I became aware of um, um, the story of the uh, of the black American women who were so crucial yeah. in the in the space race yeah the human computers these brilliant mm. mathematicians is that hidden figures hidden that film it's such a great uh, film which is a film mm. and a book now you know Ni you know, the first moon landing was 1969 when I was born, and yet it's the best part of 30 years later before I'm aware of that story to my shame because that history hadn't been written or shared with me. And I think if books like that were more, um, were more prevalent, if they were on the school curriculum, it wouldn't just inspire people to struggle and to, um, and to be active citizens. It would probably encourage more girls to get involved in STEM subjects as well. Mm -hmm. but, and that's interesting because it would, because I loved it too, and, and I think that it, it would encourage girls to get more involved in STEM subjects. And also, if the Hollywood version hadn't completely airbrushed out the fact that those women were in the civil rights movement, which of course, is, if, for those of you who know the book, will know that that is, is a very significant part of the book, um, that that political organisation comes with it too. And that, that's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> reflects back to what, what you were saying, Caitlin, that it, it, it is... Uh, I think it is significant, Melissa, in the question that you asked. You were saying about how the compression of history and how very recent it feels, mm. you know, and, and that they're, these are, you know, you're just literally virtually talking about great grandmothers. Yeah. Um, but the point that Caitlin makes about being, uh, being inspired as, as a teenager, of course, reminds us that so much of the suffragette movement were young teenage mm. women. Mm. And they objected not only to the, the constitutional suffragists who had been asking nicely and asking nicely and asking nicely, who they thought were their rather over-polite mothers and grandmothers, um, but, but uh, also they, you know, in the context of them wanting that to, to, to change in their lifetimes. And I do think that, um, and, and as you found when you were looking at it, the, the youth, I mean, the, the number of, like, really young women, teenagers, you know, sc school children, both in, obviously, in, 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 in a trade union organisation, in the factories where the major, you know, amount of the work was done, but also amongst, you know, the middle class, the, if, you, if you want to put it in that way, the sort of, you know, the bourgeois kids who were getting involved. A lot of them were, like, 15, 16 years of age. And there was this anger against... Um, you know, the sense that things must change. It was a modern world. And I think if you think that we're living in a time when there is another youth movement, mm. we look at the basis of momentum, for example, well, yes, for sure. I mean, if you have... If there is any kind of anxiety about where that energy is channelled or how it speaks politically or how it's, how it's speaking to a present age, um, I think there is a direct link between in, in that. Yeah, but also, when you think about... If you read press coverage of the way suffragettes were treated and official treatment of them, it's very similar to the way that... People people who are involved in momentum are treated now. I mean, the way that only history rescue history rescues people's values and rightness later, as it were. Isn't that true? I mean, the suffragettes were treated... Well, they were, yeah, demonised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the word I'm searching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they were, you know, they were troublesome women and, and that's why they were they were locked up in Holloway. But, but Holloway couldn't cope because it had, you know, up to 200 women being admitted on a single day, mm. all refusing to give their names, mm. all refusing to abide by the rules. And by 1912, uh, the governor had a breakdown. He just couldn't mm. deal with hundreds of women not abiding by but, the rules. And then all over the country, you know, exponentially, I think at one point, you'll remember better than I do, but at one point there are like 10, 12,000 women and men in, mm. in prison, mm. all over the country, you know, all over England, all over Scotland. Mm. So it's that, you know, it's this, this real sense of a mass, you know, yeah. a, a mass mm. movement, which was also allied, let us not forget, by 1912. And this, of course, is the interesting thing. I mean, the really interesting thing is basically... Millicent Fawcett and the suffragists, right, had that long history. And then what happened in 1912? They went into an alliance with the new Labour Party. And it was the umbrella organisation of the Labour Party, the independent Labour Party, the ILP, and the NUWSS, which Millicent Fawcett was running, with the other umbrella organisations and, and, you know, the co-op movement, who then were part of that campaign 
that, that went through the war and at the end got the vote. And when I was watching that publicity, and of course, you know, as you rightly say, Shami, I we start talking about statues, what does it really represent? But these things become focused on it. I was just waiting for one media channel. You know, it obviously wasn't going to be the BBC, but just for someone, you know, other than the Daily Mirror to point out that actually this was something that was a platform, that was an alliance between the constitutional suffragists and the, the Labour, Labour Party. Movement. When you say you were waiting... The Labour waiting, Party and the ILP yeah. and the Labour Movement When you say you're waiting, point, you're waiting in this centenary year for this to be acknowledged. No, no, I just... In during that coverage, I yeah. was interested in the, in the fact that it was elided. So yeah. that that connection between broader political movements and where the allegiances were, mm. uh, as if it was not... So well, it goes back to your point about momentum, as if it was not a Labour story. Yeah. That's I, I think that's, that's always the danger with a sort of very narrow individualist feminism, if you like, of that it's not seen in the context of, of broader, wider social struggle. And, it, and if you're not careful... Mm. Um, it becomes separated from politics, which and I don't see how that can work if you want to continue to improve the lot of women. And it also becomes separated from the interests of men and boys mm. as well because, um, because they're on the other side of the suffering of this terrible, weird gender apartheid, not just in this country but all over the world and forever. And so for me... Uh, my own feminism cannot be separated from, from my, my broader values about socialism or human rights, internationalism yeah. and so, so on. So just two points before we leave the suffragettes. To be fair to the BBC, they did do a programme on suffragettes and their male allies, many of whom were mm. in the Labour yeah. movement, because I've done work on Keir Hardy. So mm. Keir Hardy was actually an incredible, the first leader of the Labour Party, an incredible supporter of it. But also, I don't want to forget the individual bravery. I mean, I accept it's not an individual matter, but the bravery mm. of the women in Holloway. Mm. I mean, when I looked, when I read in your book what they went through mm. and they went back for more, as it were, mm. it is extraordinary. Mm. I mean, and, and, and when I'm, as a reader, one can only mm. test it against your own sense of would I do that yeah, yeah. and the truth so, is true. I wouldn't mm. you see oh, that's, I, I, well, that's exactly what I was thinking yeah, yeah because you know researching that I think would I be in a suffragette obviously would I have smashed the windows yup would I have gone <laughs> to prison yup I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have gone on hunger strike would you that, have bombed Holloway no. um, <laughs> I don't know about I don't know maybe maybe if I was young I don't think I would I don't think I'd bomb somewhere mm. ne I, I think I'd be too aware of you know you, you're going to you're going to hurt somebody. <laughs> um, but I, I couldn't have gone on hunger strike. That's the point that I, that I couldn't have been force fed. And, you know, I always wondered and couldn't really establish, did the women, because it wasn't, it was one woman that did that. They didn't agree on it. It was simply a woman, Marion Wallace Dunlop from, uh, from Inverness. And she wrote to the governor and said, unless I'm given political statements, <coughs> st uh, 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 you know, a status, from now on, I'm going to refuse all food. And four days later, they let her out because she was ill. But at that moment, the van arriving to Holloway, coming from the courts, had 14 women <coughs> suffragettes, and they heard what Marion had done, and they said, right, we're all going to follow suit. And so it's that thing of, you know, that's how it spread, you know, with different... But I, I, that was something that, yeah, that I couldn't have... I couldn't have done. <coughs> yeah. So let, can we take up another strand which relates both to your book and your work and Shami's work, which is about the intersection which we've already touched on between feminism and class. Mm -hmm. And so what's very striking in your book is how different classes of prisoners were treated. Mm -hmm. And if you look, in fact, through the history of Holloway, you had upper-class women who went to Holloway who were given the right to have a bottle of... half a bottle of wine mm -hmm. a week. Well, and I God, that's not enough, is it? No, no, that, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I, I, I thought that. But, I mean, um, but of course, you know, and Diana Mosley, uh, mm -hmm. Oswald Mosley's um, well, wife in prison during mm -hmm. the war, yeah. Well, prisons, really, the, the, the point of prison in the Victorian times was really to contain... The working class that's that's who they were built mm. for so if you had nowhere to live then you'd be arrested for homelessness and put in holloway because holloway was built for for men and boys mainly uh, not women um if you didn't have a job you were arrested for vagrancy and then you were locked up in holloway um you know where you did hard labor so the problem was in in britain of course what happens if we've got somebody 
you know, with a title? What if we've got Lady So and So or Lord So and So? Or mm. you know, how are we going to put them <laughs> in in Holloway Prison? So you had three divisions, which were called classes, three classes. So basically, if you were working class, you were in the third division, Incredible. and you slept on a piece of uh, wood, and you had you know gruel put through the hatch for you for yourself to eat. If you were, um, you know, from a more privileged class, and quite a few journalists fell into this class, then you rented the apartment in the prison, um, and you and you sent out to Harrods for food, and you could have as much wine as you, you want. In fact, even that on remand, extreme. you could have a half bottle of wine as recent as the 1980s, I think it was. But anyway, um, so you could send out for things. Um, you could have as many visitors and letters uh, as you wanted. You had other... Prisoners would do your washing um, and your cleaning. And so your punishment was being removed from the, from the world. You weren't being punished once you were in prison. But if you're working class, then you've got the double punishment. You know, you're being sent there as punishment. And then once you're in there, um, you're being punished as well. So with the suffragettes, you've got very, very different experiences. Like Alice Hawkins, the, the woman from Leicester with the, with the statue, when, when she arrived in Holloway, she identified with the wardresses which the, the more well-off uh, suffragettes didn't. But, she, but because the wardresses uh, had almost as low status, they came from domestic service uh, backgrounds. So she I identified with them. Um, but then you also had very wealthy suffragettes like Lady Constance Lytton, and she, she tried her best not to, be, not mm. to accept um, the privileges that she was given. And then when she went undercover... Uh, so in Holloway, they decided that her heart was weak and she was put in the hospital wing and she was treated nicely. And when she dressed up as a working class seamstress from, I think, from uh, East London, I think it was Liverpool she was arrested in and she was put in. And then she found out exactly how you're mm -hmm. treated if you're working class because the doctor basically force-fed her a few times, slapped her around the face. And, you know, she, she, she had a, a stroke, I think, you know, soon afterwards. And also you had, you know, the, the, the Pankhurst could, could complain about things. They could say, you know, no, I'm not going to do this and, and this is out of order. But if you had someone like Dora uh, Tudis, the 16-year-old uh, mill worker from Yorkshire, you know, she was on remand, so she hadn't been convicted of any crime, but she was still forced to, to wear prison uniform with the arrows on it and to have a number. And she was humiliated and, and it worked. You know, she went back home and you mm. never heard of her again. So it's, it's, but it's two things, isn't it? Because you quote the governor of Holloway at one point saying, these women aren't supposed to be yes. in here. These upper-class women are not supposed to be in prison. <laughs> what he didn't, and yeah. it was she, or was it she or he then? It was I a he, yeah. he, And he didn't know what to do. But the other yeah. thing is, that, of course, if you were from certain class, you had a public voice, which meant that you could... Um, <coughs> you talk to people of influence. I mean, I do remember in the book, you say Diana Mosley at one point was somebody said why aren't you why don't you do something about your conditions do you know anyone you can talk to and she said no anyone i can talk to i know the whole cabinet yes. you know churchill's my cousin yes. um you know I mean, one of the many unattractive things about diana mosley but <laughs> you, um, well there's, there's nothing attractive about her at all um, except but, except i mean she hadn't committed a crime she was in holloway she for, married oswald for, mosley for, for, for years. Years. <laughs> and like um most women in prison she she was separated from her children mm. one of the you know, things so yeah. you've got to feel some yeah one of the things that i really liked about sarah gavron's movie yeah. um i don't know if other people saw it the 2015 movie suffragette mm. is that those class distinctions are there so for example in the scene where the the posh woman gets bailed by her politician husband who's mm. really disgusted with her and she wants her comrade sisters to be bailed and he's not going to let that mm. happen and she's like but it's my money so you, so you definitely see those divisions mm. but you also see the developing solidarity mm. between between the women of different classes. I mean, it's focused that the heroine is, of course, Maud Watts, um, played by Kerry Mulligan, and she is, you know, she is the, the laundress from the Glasshouse Laundry, but rises to a status in the movement where mm. she is, by the end of the movie, um, giving direction mm. to, um, you know, to much posher, posher women. And you see, you, you do see this sense of solidarity between mm. the suffragettes because they are a sort of army, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and they have ranks. They develop ranks according to their place in the movement um, over time, unless uh, unless. 
class loyalty to something. But you know, yeah. thinking about relationship between culture and politics, which you touch on a lot in the contemporary world, that film didn't really get recognised within the film world. And do you think it was to do with all its themes, or I, I think there were two. I, I think I think there were two reasons why it didn't get the recognition that I believe it, it, it really deserves and, and probably will have in years to come, because I think it's really the first mainstream movie as opposed to TV serialisation mm. um, about suffragettes. The, the, the first um, problem is that it is the subject matter. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's about these women. All the, you know, there are some great male performances, I think, in it, but mm. the subject matter will always um, be a problem in, in our, our world. But the, the second really unfortunate problem was the reception in the US because somebody in the PR department made a very foolish error. You, you remember the scene in the movie where um, Emily Pankhurst is on a balcony and, and ends with the great words, I'd rather be a rebel than a slave. Well, some silly PR in the US put that on T-shirts for all the stars to wear and, of course, I'd rather be a rebel than a slave in the United States yeah. of America yeah. is a whole different mm. ball game. And so that caused mm. um, consternation. And was this a racist movie? Was it, you know, rebels and slaves? In, in yeah. Yeah. And that was really, really unfortunate. Mm. And I think it probably really um, damaged the film's mm. prospects in at the Oscars, for example, and, and in the US, very unfairly, very unfairly. Yeah, because it just felt as if it was a film that marked something very important that then kind of fell into a ravine it wasn't didn't get enough attention but well i hope over t i hope over time people people will go back to it and o over time it will get the the recognition that it deserves because i think there's there's so much that i've seen the movie perhaps a dozen times Have you? Now, yeah really uh, yeah Oh my God, that um, really is, that is a. All? Yeah. Is that well, all? I was going to say, but also Meryl Streep as Emily Pankhurst, you know, whoa. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very but I went to the toilet at that point. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> completely, completely miss Meryl. Well, you can see so it again. Do you know, you I, I'm going to be at risk being unpopular and think, I didn't think that was the best bit. But we, we'll move on. No, but it from helped that. to it probably helped to bring the money in for the mm. movie. Oh no, didn't of course it, it did. Yeah. Meryl Streep, money, attention. Um, but you know, Meryl Streep as Margaret Thatcher, attention. Meryl Streep as Emily Pankhurst, not. You know, there's yeah, a big yeah, discussion no. here. Yeah. Look, time is moving on. Sure. I'm, I'm going to. I want to talk about the price of political life and come back to your work on Eleanor and Sylvia in mm. a second. But Shami, just your book takes us a hundred years on and takes us to now, and really. Uh, this, is it fair to say the book's about what's still very wrong now? Glimmers of light in the landscape because of technological and political change and feminist change, and then proposals for making it even better. Is that is that fair? And do you want to give us a uh, highlight? Well, look, it's a small book, so you can. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it, it's a you know it's a little sort of Mary Poppins handbag of a book. But 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 um, hmm. I, I try to slice it up into different aspects of life. Um, um, from health to wealth to education to personal security and insecurity and look at the loss of women all over the world. The good news, because I know that I can come across as quite grim sometimes, the, <laughs> the, 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 the good news in the book for me, the, the most uplifting um, part of the last hundred years is probably education. Mm -hmm. Um, and how in the developed world in particular, we've moved to nearly universal secondary education for boys and girls. And I think that's, th that's phenomenal. And, and, and <coughs> what then comes from that for girls and women is, is extraordinary. For every extra year that a woman spends in education, um, her economic and health and other life chances and those of any children, and there will be fewer children, which is basically a good thing. Um, you know, the, the, the ramifications are just so positive. So that's the good news in my book. But, the but there are enormous challenges. And like you, I'm incredibly concerned about the rise of Trump and Putin and so on. I mean, if you think about... I, I had to actually read in um, with some care uh, some of... Uh, the president's remarks about girls and women, including his own daughter. Um, mm. Some of the, he's these, just a creep. These things. I mean, you could. Uh, well, he's mm. arguably. Well, he's an internet troll, and he's he's sitting in the White House. And the fact that he took the keys from to the White House from a woman who was once seen as a dead cert wouldn't necessarily have been my ideal president, but nonetheless, it's a pretty depressing outcome when everyone thought it was going to be Hillary Clinton, then it's Donald Trump, and what he considers it acceptable uh, to say about women, and of course to do to families with this latest caging mm. program 
um, absolutely extraordinary. And, and what, what must it feel like to be raising children in the United States at the moment? How do you tell them mm. about acceptable and unacceptable um, conduct in the real world or online when that is but Mr. Course, President? You know, quite a lot of them voted for him. Well, well, well that's that's really Including interesting women, too. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I noted that in, in the book that um, yeah, a lot of women voted for Donald Trump. We had um, white women. White women, uh, whereas uh, black and Latina women went with went with Hillary Clinton. So it just shows that the the racial this is the intersectionality. Yeah. This is what the youngsters call it intersectionality. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, but uh, I call it multiple identity or just the truth of people's experience. There are conflicting loyalties. You know, again, in Sarah Gavron's lovely movie, there's that fantastic scene where. Um, where Maud Watts says to the policeman, what are you going to do? We're in every family. We're half the human race. You can't lock us all up. And that seems so exciting and so positive, except that being half the human race is both an opportunity and a challenge because of conflicting loyalties. And in, in the US, it seems to be um, race in particular. But just finally, I would say that you cannot, um, you cannot talk about women's rights as if they were only are civil and political yeah. rights like the vote. Clearly, reproductive rights, still a problem all over the world, including just five minutes away in Northern Ireland, and economic, social and economic rights. So of course, I want to see quotas in the boardroom, but what about the people not just sitting at the top table, but cleaning those tables and building those tables? What about zero hours contracts? What about austerity? These are feminist issues, and it is the poorest women that we must care the most about, I think. I'm trying to stop. Not s <laughs> um, vote Jeremy Corbyn is probably the follow of that. But um, the, the biggest shocking statistic in your book for me was that half of all women in the world, between 15 and 24, think it's legitimate for a man to beat his wife? There was some start, there's some startling data from, I mean, from international. So, I mean, I, I suppose it's what, I mean, this is the, this begins in the home, doesn't it? And what you see is what you believe over time to be acceptable. And so, you know, n now we go back to what you call them second wave feminists. We go back to our Jermaine Greers and, and other people who were looking. Um, actually, one of the wonderful things about writing this little book was reading a lot of other people's very big books that I had perhaps read when I was too young to really appreciate them. And The Female Eunuch was one in yeah. particular that I went back to and was just s surprised by how relevant it still is. And to think that Jermaine wrote that when she was not yet 30 is, is whether you agree or disagree with everything that she says at the moment, um, you've got to give her credit for the, for the female eunuch. And I think in particular, for me, the chapter called Love um, is an extraordinary piece of uh, human observation. And, and the idea that, you know, family can, can be a wonderful thing, but it can be a cage and it can be a cage for men and women, and it can bring out some appalling, um, some appalling self-destructive and mutually destructive yeah. behaviours. Mm. No, I like that. You, I liked your enthusiasm for that book. And Jermaine Greer is so controversial now that to have her rescued in her historical context and all her passion, and you know, she's been a hugely important figure. So I. I will go back to the female unit because of your book. And that's what's great also about writing, women writing about other women's work, mm. is that we kind of keep rediscovering mm. what other people have said. So look, one of the things of this session that I really want to bring out, because I feel it very passionately, is the price that women pay for political action. I mean, and you've written about two women, Rachel. Eleanor Marks, who is you know, a quite extraordinary woman who... Mm. I was reminded they died at 43 mm. and may have been murdered by her ne'er-do-well partner, Edward mm. Avening. But who, if you read about what she did in the, I mean, you know, she's a bit earlier than the period that you write about, but the sort of m building of the trade union movement and so on, and Sylvia Pankhurst, mm. just give us a flavour of their achievements, but the price that they paid. Because I think we need more respect for political women. That's mm. really what I'm trying to get across here. Well, in terms of their achievement, I mean, I think that, 
they are quite clearly as, as key political figures who were very well known in, in their sequential lives. And their lives are sequential. I mean, Sylvia Pankhurst is literally a sequel to Eleanor Marx because when she was 13, her uh, father took her to a meeting that Eleanor Marx and William Liebknecht were doing in Manchester. And Sylvia Pankhurst sat there and went, right, OK. I mean, she, she writes about it later in life. So it's literally, in terms of intellectual and political history, which we really need to write and reclaim for ourselves, that they're, they're, they're handing on the baton. And I think that in our political histories, it's quite important to have that, because we have lots of queens um, and socialites um, and and we have literary feminism, whether it's you know the great Mary Wollstonecraft or whether it's Virginia Woolf. But actually, in terms of the the, the political feminism and the people who are engaged, and the consequences, yes, for your life, but actually the consequences for for the outcome, because one and I, and I will answer that bit about them being political women. But I just think in term there was something that they had in common, which really does affect this conversation that we're having, because. There is, of course, no doubt that symbolically, I mean, we, you know, we are, we do, there are very many good reasons to celebrate this vote, but, but also what happened when women got it, right? So you have this, this what Eleanor Marx and Sylvia Pankhurst had in common went right back to your point about, I guess, what we now call intersectionality, but what would be the, the sense they both came out of political families where they were, that were already part of broader movements and they were based on abolitionism, um, uh, in Sylvia's, in, in Eleanor's case, trade unionism, not necessarily in, in the Pankhurst case, um, but certainly just that sort of British, you know, of chartism right through anti, uh, abolition and the building of a labour mo uh, a movement and, and, and universal representation. And whether it's in that early moment or whether it's as you know the period in in which caitlin's talking about the the holloway i mean and you were talking referencing it in terms of suffragette because historical moments change it was a really important period where there was a class connection and the middle class and the upper class women learned and got insights and the mm. prison stuff as you know they all write including constance Lytton. she says going to prison was what enabled us to understand what our lives were what we did not didn't know, and they yeah. and it enabled just like the, it was the trenches. It was the equivalent yeah, of the that trenches. Is interesting. Yeah. So that so that and and so so what we're really talking about here is there was a and this is really important about the suffragettes and I'm afraid not the constitutional suffragists was that there was a lot of class mixing yeah. and middle class women and aristocratic women who and some of them did in the end you know were cleaning out their cells and doing stuff like that but they mm. saw a whole different world and they said there's no going back, there is no going back. So what happened in 1918 was actually a huge... Well, it actually happened earlier with the split of the WSPU. So when the, when the women's movement... When that part of the women's movement split between the Pankers, it's a huge class betrayal of a movement that had worked together right from its roots with trade unionism, with the women and basically the Lancashire mill workers and, and all of the origins of the WSPU in socialism. And... What, what the anxiety about the partial vote was, was that, I mean, can we just ask ourselves, why did the Liberal government, I mean, what the, okay, co, you know, that coalition, but basically still led by the Liberals, as you know, because of the, the carnage and destruction uh, of, 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 of mainly young men during the First World War, and what was happening, by the way, there was that small matter of the, of the Bolshevik revolution, or, well, eventually, of the Russian revolution that had been happening during the war. It's absolute terror that the world was never going to be the same again. And what they're worried about is that basically you've got <coughs> universal male suffrage. They're really, really worried on the back that now the labor movement is going to take over. Mm. So the women's vote was seen as a bullock. That's why it was qualified against the rise of labour. And, and whether we like it or not, for the next 10 years until 1928, the majority of women voted Conservative mm. and kept that... I mean, that, those are just the facts. So, the out, so people like Sylvia Pankhurst and Eleanor Marx, through their entire careers... And actually, interestingly, they come from political families where they both go against their, their, their... If you like, they rebel against their fathers, although they're 
did Eleanor Marks rebel against Karl oh, Marx? Oh, yes, of course. OK, all yeah. right. But I, I, I saw Politic her as being very much within that tradition. <coughs> yeah, but politically she yeah. did. I mean, she was part of the early forming of the ILP. And, I mean, certainly they, she didn't rebel in the sense that he, you know, that he was based... He was in, in terms of democratic socialism. But she was, at certain stages of her career, and as she went on, she was, because she was, and even from a young age, I mean, she was much more revolutionary. I mean, she was, you know, she was Athenian, he never was. She was in favor of armed struggle, he never was. He believed, in, you know, totally always in peaceful, as did Engels, peaceful, democratic, mm. you know, change and so on. But always inclusive of, 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 of uh, and, and also in terms of the international context, what was going on in the rest of, even in Western Europe and beyond, but in America as well, was that the women's movement were tied to forms of struggles for social democracy, mm. and even as in the case of France, revolution that we'd never had here. Mm. So the women like Clara Zetkin, who was, the, as I'm sure many, many of you know, was the socialist feminist who was the founder of International Women's Day that we celebrate you know, on the 8th of March every year, which, of course, was the trigger for the, for the 1917 revolution. Yeah. Um, and so those women and Rosa Luxemburg and the women who represented that, that global force, and there were some women from broader around the world as well as America, were very much saying that the feminist platform had to be not a separatist platform because it was our brothers and yeah. husbands as well. Otherwise, we'll never... Th that is not liberation. And we're very upset... Um, you know, that, that was the pressure. Both Eleanor and Sylvia were internationalists in that regard, yes. and that is why they kind of stuck to that But, you platform. know, the, the thing that strikes me is in terms of back to how histories are seen, you know, one of the things I think is excellent about your biography of Eleanor Mar Marx is it really, it's a history of political meetings, trade union, you know, it, whereas if you do a history of Virginia Woolf, it's a history of relationships, infidelity, a room of one's own literature. It's much harder to... to, to to get that history into the mainstream, that's what I think, and to tell it as a story, and and you do it, you know, you do do it ex exceptionally well. Well, it's but, very you know. kind of you. I'm lucky also that because that my um, my editor who did that book, Bill Bill Swainson. Um, I mean, it's like it, it's like whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction. The thing is that like, people's lives can be, you know, repetitive. We don't want to know what happens every day, even you know. And, and, and actually, when women who were journ who tried to journal in prison were like, I just can't write the same stuff every day but actually bill had to take out about a nut you know a, a really about 30 percent of that book because which was bawdy rigid with this because sometimes she's going to 11 meetings in a day and he's like rachel it's really good that you've tracked that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that day and that month and week but actually you just need to give us a flavor yeah, but, but, you but see that's the, part of it too but yeah. you see but i think the important thing the, the women who changed our culture and our politics they did go to 11 meetings today. i just um, think it's very yeah, you know i mean i know you point. two are going on to another meeting today you know so <laughs> that is the nature of political life and we need to I just think it's important to acknowledge it mm. because they were and, and, and as well, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we'll. I, I've got other questions, and but I'm going to open it up to the floor. And if nobody asks a question, I'll just keep on with my own. But I have a feeling that already the hands are going up. So there's a <laughs> microphone to uh, go round. Hi, thanks very much. It's just this is just um, a question about uh, representation. I was recently asked to write a reference uh, for the nominee of the 2018 John Templeton Prize, which is a prize of a million pounds. Wow. Um, for spirituality and peace, and it was for an American, and I gladly did it. But when I looked at the website, the prize has been going for at least four or five decades. I was really shocked to see that three women had won it, including Mother Teresa. So I wrote to them. And Did you say them, only three had won it? You only mean? three Sorry, in yeah. four or five decades. I think it's five. Yeah. I said, why might this be? And they said, well, we don't get the nominations. You know, very lame. I thought, I'll just wait and see what happens, because the prize came out last week. And guess what? Another man. So my question is... You know, I'm Who Donald Trump, it. perhaps. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the king of Jordan. Okay. Um, so my question is, what I'm absolutely kind of fuming about it, as a, mm. you know, with a small voice. What can we do? G uh, Marina, do you mind if we take two or three questions and then people are like, is that okay? Um, here. Yes, I'll just uh, could you could you wait for a microphone? Cause then it's a bit distracting hearing other people. Yeah. 
Is no. It no. Hold it really close, perhaps. Hold it really close. Just. Hello. No. Hello, hello. Okay. If you say it, I'll repeat it. Oh dear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I've done a lot of work on World War One and the suffrage movement, and I'm just um, I think uh, another aspect that I find um, worryingly missing, and not necessarily amongst you folks up there. But is that when um, when the war began in 1914, so many women involved in the suffrage movement here in this country immediately tried to work on behalf of the war. Mm -hmm. and they kind of said, "Okay, we can't do this anymore because it's a war." And the part of that history that I that I know about, luckily, and I don't know at all by any means, but there were these women's hus the Scottish women's hospitals. I mean, you know, I mean, they were set up by Dr. Elsie Inglis. After, as soon as the war started, she went to, she, said she wanted an all-woman hospital. That's what she wanted. She said, the men are going to be busy doing other stuff. I can do it. I can set up this hospital. She went to the war office and told them this and, and offered this. And I can't remember the military, whoever she spoke to, but they said, oh, no, no, you go and do your knitting. No, no, you can't do that. And yeah, sorry. No, only in the sense that people can't hear you. So if you could make it, uh, so you're saying that an enormous amount of women got involved yeah. in the First World War effort. Yes. And have you a question that follows yes. from well, that? Oh, yeah. I just wondered if people could comment on that. I mean, okay. that's an aspect of the war, the suffering, that, that kind of leap that you all were making about here's this movement, you know, and the, and the yeah. prison, and then how do we kind of lose a chunk of that? Okay, so in a way, why did women support a national war effort? Is there a third question? Caroline there, and then I, we're going to ask our panel to respond. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about it. Is the microphone working now? Because it does help. Do you, th do you think the internet <laughs> has democratising effect? Oh, there we are. That is what I call a very perfect audience question. <laughs> <laughs> so... The first yeah, question, yeah, and uh, anybody yeah. who wants to answer it, about these major prizes. I mean, I would want to comment about suddenly there's a, we're in a world where so people either win a million or nothing. I just, uh, you know, it's like... Yeah. So I could jump in. Yeah, uh, jump in there. Right. Very briefly. Um, I, um, my book is ultimately, more than anything else, an argument for affirmative action, mm. stroke the Q word. <coughs> Quotas. You know, if not now, then when... Uh, the argument, I've been on a journey in my life when I was 20, nothing, I didn't, be, I didn't want to be a token. And guess what? You know, people thought I was a token anyway. Mm. And, uh, and now I meet, you know, some very bright young women in their 20s and they say, well, I'm, I liked your book, Shami, but I'm not sure about affirmative action because I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that I didn't get here, here on merit. And, uh, and, and particularly my Tory friends in the House of Lords, Tory women say, oh, no, no, we believe in meritocracy. And I'm like, I believe in meritocracy too, and this ain't it. Yeah, yeah, particularly in the House of Lords. But anyway, um, and so, um, so I, I think it's time for radical change. I think it's time to change uh, the law in certain areas. Um, I think that we should, um, in terms of the economy, in terms of the British economy, there are some jobs where it should be possible to make a business case for affirmative action. And by the way, it could go in both directions because I think, for example, there's a crisis of not enough young men going into primary school teaching, and it would be really, really good for a lot of our, uh, our kids, particularly fatherless kids. So a head teacher should be able to say, um, I've got six women going on um, maternity leave, I'm going to have young men come into those jobs. But equally, there are lots of areas where there should be quotas and affirmative action for women. Now, that won't necessarily help with your prize. You said, how can me... How can I, with my one voice, do something about it? Well, obviously, by coming together with lots of other people's voices, which takes me to the third question about the internet. Yes, of course, it can be an incredibly democratising place and a place for you to, um, to name and shame the Templeton Prize and get other people to join with you in that group. And, and maybe if it becomes a big enough group and a big enough story, the, the trustees of that prize will think... Um, 
again, but it's not just a democratizing place. It's also at the moment a bit of a Wild West place where a lot of really, really nasty misogynist bile is placed. And these great big media platforms are going to have to self-regulate or yeah. regulation may have to be to some extent placed upon them, I think. Yeah, couldn't you say to the Templeton Prize, I always think in politics it's good if you have a, a solution rather than just and a criticism. So why not every year a woman, every year a man? I don't see why you can't. And then if you, it's true that, you know, I notice that if something like your bag goes missing with an airline, if you tweet them, they answer. They are all looking at the internet. Mm. So, I mean, it is, a, it, mm. is, it is a platform. So I wonder whether either of you have a, it have to be a briefish answer to the question of the lady in the front about how things changed in the First World War. If you've got any insight into that. Well, no, because I and then I'm jumping ahead and think, well, why do so many of them become fascists? Why did we have suffragettes back in? I'm not answering the question at all. Why do we have suffragettes back in Holloway? Um, and this yeah. time, because they're fascists, and they've already been in Holloway. Okay. Oh, yeah, I mean, and 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 the ones who became fascists were the ones who stayed in the WSPU. So it's it, it's again, it's politics. Okay. The, I think there's a problem with the microphone. Do you want to say it again, Caitlin? Well, what you well sure, what she's saying yeah. is why so many suffragettes were back in Holloway in the First World War as fascists, mm. or back in Holloway... Second, Second, World, Second World, War. World War, sorry, as fascists. Yeah. And, and also, as Caitlin knows, that's absolutely true, um, and also there were many women who had... So basically what happens is that when the war starts, a deal is... Emmeline em em and Christabel Pankhurst, the Women's Social and Political Union, do a deal with the government. And in exchange for supporting the war effort and being patriotic, because Emmeline Pankhurst was many wonderful things, and she is extraordinary, but she was also a xenophobe. She also ended up standing as, I mean... You as know, a Tory. As, as a Tory, as a, a, you know, a, a, in a Conservative seat. They set up the Women's Party and so on. But so basically what happens is they support the war. So the suffragette... That amazing newspaper, which had been, you know, because we haven't even touched on that side of it, but it is also an answer about the internet and the printing press. Overnight, it stops, right, in 1914. They cease publication, and it is republished a week later as Britannia, right, yeah. with Boudicca on the front and a, and a big flag. And what happens is there's already been breakaways. We talked about the Pethic Lawrences earlier in the group. There's already been a breakaway, and the movement splits between, as the whole country splits, between who supports the war effort and doesn't and in brief the answer to your question is we never I mean all these people agreed including Sylvia who was a pacifist that the the second world war was a war that had to be fought but we are not agreed historically yeah. that the first world war is Quiet. a war that had to be fought but the dominant version of history because of it you know but basically because the argument of the people who broke away and the suffragettes who went to the East London Federation of Suffragettes with Sylvia or stayed with the labor movement Keir Hardy famously literally died brokenhearted yeah. in 1915 because the, the, the socialist leaders supported the war effort rather than sticking to the, the socialist commitment. So it, it's, that, it's that broader reason yeah. why. And, and then you've got people like in 1917, Alice mm. Wilden, who, mm. working class woman, her, and, and she was a, a pacifist, and so she was opposing the war. Uh, the slaughter of so many people, etc., which is obviously not what the, the, the government, government... Not... <laughs> <laughs> we found your voice. It's very <laughs> symbolic. <laughs> Keith? And how loud is my voice? Right? Yeah, <laughs> and not, not the message that the... Um, where's the little thingy? Not the message that, you know, the government wanted. And so Alice Wilden was, was set up by uh, British security and framed on some ridiculous charge of, of plotting to mm. kill... Uh, the Prime Minister yeah. and the leader of the Labour Party and it was argued that she and her daughters were going to go to where Lloyd George was playing golf, hide in the bushes um, and then fire some special South American poison through a little pipe, hit him kill him, no one would know where it came from. And th to the extent this, they were put on trial. Mm. They were put on trial, they were convicted, they were found guilty, and they were locked up in Holloway Prison. Completely and by, trumped up charge. Completely trumped up charge. Yeah. They, 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 you know, they were pacifists, they were, they were um, a conscientious objectors, and so Alice was running or almost a, a bit of an underground network to, to keep men away from the war, and, and that was a big challenge. Um, and so... 
I can't remember how I got onto that. We're talking but, about but the fact that, that, yeah, that when you did, when you get women like her again, who was a suffragette, who were opposing the war, I mean, she she's dead. She died because you know of 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 her treatment in Holloway and, Prison. And basically. the only newspaper which was at that point already actually had international reach was Sylvia Pankhurst's Women's Dreadnought, as you know, was that would just ignored all the bans because there were government bans on on you know talking about writing about any of this stuff mm. and she just and she was like you know that the woman's dread what was one of the only newspapers that were actually you know interviewing and running running the, that terrible mm. wielding case but yeah mm. it's a really it's a really good example okay i've just somebody's whispered in my ear saying we have to wrap up a bit earlier than i thought which is a real pity i did just want to finish picking up on caroline's <laughs> question about the democratization of the internet I think if we're talking about the price women pay mm. for activism, we have to note the terrible price that a lot of women pay in terms of abuse mm. and how terrifying it is. And in your book, you, you, you mentioned something about Caroline Criado Perez, who, after all, is more of an individualist, you mm. know, and for more mainstream acceptable, but, you know, tried to get Jane Austen on a banknote and get to go back to the statue, got that statue put up in the um, Parliament Square. And it's just... You know, like many women, like Diane Abbott, who's well, been uh, just utterly... Te I mean, the terrorising... I, I spoke to a senior policeman for that bit of the book who very kindly shared his experience with me, and, and he said that in relation to um, MPs... Um, women get far, far more um, online abuse than men. Um, Labour women get far, far more abuse, generally speaking, than Conservative women, though Anna Subri gets a fair bit of um, yeah, Brexit. Being, that's yeah. Brexit. But he also told me that my friend Diane Abbott, the, the Shadow Home Secretary, gets more online abuse than all the other MPs put together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Obviously, Obviously, she's a woman, she's a black woman, and she's a black woman of the left. Yeah. And this seems to be the perfect storm and there is you know there's clearly a crisis of masculinity going on in and, and some of the guys that are doing it they're not young lads as I would have thought they're not silly boys these are middle-aged and older men in parts of the country where they feel you know disempowered etc etc who are now taking it out on people online and also we have to remember Joe Cox was killed by a right-wing yeah. activist you know this is how who how is a woman MP or a woman activist to know the difference between a man in a room sort of spewing out his bile and somebody who might be able to do something. So I think if we're going to tie up the session, we started looking at the bravery of women in, you know, who brought us the vote with all the qualifications we have about it. There are still many, many brave women today who are fighting for things that really matter. So I just think that's a good place to stop. And also to thank these three who have done, you know, contribute a huge amount to the change that thank we all want you, to Melissa. see. So, no, thank, thank you. you very much.